Hello. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. And you? Nice I'm to good, meet thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Victoria. No problem. So excited the conference is starting. <laughs> it is exciting. So I need to practice everybody's names. <laughs> so okay. Veronica, it's Veronica. Yes. Krajkova. It's Krajkova. 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 Okay. Yeah, Krajkova. Thanks. It's difficult to pronounce. <laughs> It's so lovely to see everyone's faces. I've been doing all the like documentation for the conference for like a whole semester and I'm just like names, names, names. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these are the people that associate with <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's just cool. yeah. no, it's wonderful to have people. you, you know, students, you know, being able to participate. That's always been a hallmark of this conference. It's great. Yeah, it's such an awesome opportunity to learn. I'm, I'm super excited about it. <laughs> Are you stuck? You're giving a paper too, right? I Victoria? am on Sunday, yes. Fantastic. Excited about that too. And are you a grad student or an undergrad? I'm an undergrad right now. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> I remember taking lots of undergrads to the conference in past years, so it's a great opportunity. It is. It's so fun to get to hear a bunch of people talk about wolf and share different opinions. Just what, what it's all about, really. So Veronica, are you in, you're not in Prague, are you? I'm not in Prague. I'm in a small town in the south of the Czech Republic. Yeah. But I studied my PhD I in studied, Prague. Yeah, at Charles University. Yeah, yeah. I was in Prague a long time ago, 1992. Oh, nice. On my way, I had a Fulbright in Romania for a year. And uh, oh. on my way back, um, a friend and I went back through, through different countries. Um, okay. My first time to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. But uh, oh my gosh, Prague is just an enchanting city. Just it's really gorgeous. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, but I think in terms of culture and how it looks, it's quite similar to Romania, isn't it? Or is it much different? Um, I mean, you can certainly see the similarities. There's no question. Okay. Um, mm. But I think, you know, things were not, well, I shouldn't say things were not as dire in Czechoslovakia at, yeah. at the time, but um, I was in Yash in Romania. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've been to Romania yet. Yeah. No. Um, and it, it's a beautiful, it's like the old sort of 19th century cultural capital of Romania. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of beauty, it's much more beautiful than yeah. Bucharest, okay. for example. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, Prague seemed just enchanting. Uh, yeah, it's really beautiful. And Budapest as well. I mean, it felt mm -hmm. like, you know, progressively, you know, as you sort of went across, you know, it felt <laughs> yeah. like things, you know, began to, exactly. to feel more, more, not necessarily relaxed, but you could see mm -hmm. the, the impact of all those years of communist dictatorship. It yeah, just incredible. exactly. Yeah. And Budapest is really beautiful. I love that city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd love to go back. Yeah, uh, oh, like fortunately now everything is newly reconstructed in Prague, so I guess it looks even nicer than you remember it. So, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> 1992, everybody was still a little bit rocky, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> used to be much different. So I'm going to. I have um, downloaded your slideshow and your. Um, uh, access copy and okay. I can post them to the chat or um, Victoria what's the one question I should have asked Amy this morning was um, whether or not um, it was going to be recommended that um, each of the panelists be made a co-host so that they could share their own slides or or should I open her slides and she can talk through them what any any directions that way um as far as instructions so far about that, I knew that I was supposed to make the chat moderator, which is you, I made you a co-host. Right. But I didn't know if I was supposed to make the panelists a co-host. Yeah. 
I think uh, but, it, sorry, I think it was the practice at last year's conference because we could move the slides ourselves because otherwise we need to tell you every time. So I think it's it's better. In the all right. I mean, that makes sense to me. So yeah. if not, we'll learn for next time, but we'll just try it after this. Um, let me get you added on here. But I've actually converted my access copy to PDF, which is maybe better so that people can't change anything. So I can just post it. That's fine. Yeah, I would wait for a few minutes um, because people, as they access, won't okay. be able to access parts of right. the chat that came before they entered. Mm -hmm. So probably better okay. to wait until we're a little closer to time to start. Yeah, posting okay. Material. Hey, Emily. <laughs> how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. It's good to see you too. Emily is a former student of mine. She graduated last year and she's on her way to med school in the fall. Wow. So, um, so she's what presenting. Um, she's presenting at the same time tomorrow as I am on Friday. Separate session <laughs> on science. Well, what's the name of your panel? What is it? Bioethics? Science and ethics. Science and, science ethics. and ethics. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of excited. excited. You'll have to send me your paper since I'm going to miss it. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> What is your paper about tomorrow, Jeanette? Um, I'm talking about wolf and heterotopias. It's a concept out of Foucault that um, quite a few contemporary, um, especially feminist theorists are, are retrieving. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very interesting. It's funny that. in one of the, uh, the the flyers that Amy sent around for um, for books that are coming out. I just noticed that there's a new book on heterotopian world literature, and uh, the the authors are including Wolf in that. So so that's good. There are more people than me just talking about an old concept from Foucault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Mary Claire. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hello. And Janet, how do you want me to point out questions to you if we have like a lot of questions? Do you want me to just bring them up or how would you like me to go about that? Um, I guess, uh, you know, if there are a lot of comments in the chat, it would be helpful if you can sort of gather them and then send them yeah. to me in the Word doc, um, just so I can also see them in that format. Um, Perfect. I can definitely do that. And as soon as um, we get our third panelist in the room, I'll, you know, I should have worked this out. I kind of said it earlier, but I think maybe like five, maybe five minutes after each person's talk, if there's like an immediate question that kind of can't wait or a clarification. Um, but right. otherwise, I'm going to ask people to sort of hold their questions for the end so that we could have a, a long Q&A. Does that seem appropriate? Um, yeah. I, I just want to make sure that everybody has, you know, obviously you know, equal time. So Sounds perfect. But yeah, if there's a bunch of questions in the chat or comments in the chat, I think it would be great if you could just sort of collect them and then send them to me as a word doc. Definitely can. Perfect. So everybody else is a co-host. You've got the other three panelists as a co-host. Um I believe so. Well, I think we're still missing. Yeah, one. we're still missing Mariaki. Yeah. Right. So I, I haven't made her. Okay. Yep. Yet. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, there she is. And there she is.
years. It's good. Thank you for doing that. Hi, Mariaki. Am I pronouncing your name? Tell me, please help me pronounce your name correctly. Hi, sorry. Headphones. <laughs> Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. I think it was a good idea to collect the abstracts as well because I haven't seen them on, on the website of the conference or is there any like document where you can find all the abstracts? You know, I haven't I haven't seen that. What do you know about that, Victoria, anything? Yeah. There is not. I yeah. think it was like gonna be up to the participants if they wanted to share the abstract, okay. then they mm -hmm. can. Um, but we didn't want to make it like a requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. So I've got a couple minutes here. Mariaki, could you just help me with the pronunciation of your name? I just want to make sure I'm going to say it correctly. Sorry, Jeanette, were you talking to me? I'm, I just yes. for a second. I just oh, wanted to Mar hear the pronunciation of your name so I don't get it wrong. <laughs> no problem. It's Mareka. Mareka. And your surname? <laughs> oh, goody. Um, Crano. Crano. It's this weird. Mareka Crano. Yeah, M -I -A. weird combination of French and Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we are just at 1030. I think I will wait one more minute just to let people get into the room. <clears throat> Okay, is everybody ready? Shall we start? Sounds good to me. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Jeanette McVicker, I'm chairing the session and I wanna thank Victoria Juarez for helping us with the chat today. Um, you will see some files started, start to get posted into the chat. Um, with access copies and other kinds of things. So thanks to the panelists for doing that. I do have a couple of just quick tips for the audience before we begin. Um, and I can see everyone is, is following good Zoom protocol by keeping yourself muted until um, you ask a question or are speaking. Thank you for that. Um, audience members may put comments into the chat anytime and uh, Victoria will be helping me address those. Um, if you wish to ask a question, and I will be leaving a couple of minutes after each presenter just very briefly for sort of immediate questions. Otherwise, we'll wait until all three panelists have completed their papers, and then we'll have a general conversation and Q&A. Um, if you wish to um, ask a question, please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen for the reaction button and um, use the raise hand feature, please, because otherwise I probably won't see your hand. Um, and then that way we can keep track. Um, I will introduce our panelists as they're listed in the program. 
And as I said, I'll leave a couple of brief minutes after each speaker for something immediate that someone wants to raise. Otherwise, we'll save the questions for the end after everyone has presented. Sound good? All right. So I'm happy to introduce our panelists today. Um, Veronica Krajkova um, received her PhD from Charles University in Prague last year with her dissertation called, quote, The Problem of the Fixity of Tables, Virginia Woolf as a Non-Dualist and Process-Oriented Thinker, end quote. She teaches modernist women writers at the Faculty of Arts, University of South Bohemia. She also enjoys translating Woolf's essays. Veronica will be speaking today on Virginia Woolf's beauty-oriented ethics and ecology. Um, I will just introduce everybody right now and then um, people can pick up when it's their turn. Mary Claire Brunelli is a PhD candidate in comparative literature at the City University of New York. She received her bachelor's from Williams College in English and French and her master's in French and Romance Philology at Columbia. Her research interests include modernism, pragmatism, psychoanalysis, and visual culture. Mary Claire's paper is now, it has a new title. It is now entitled Penumbral Passages, Virginia Woolf, William James, and the Ethical Space Beyond Language. And our final panelist, Marika Krainau, is a doctoral candidate and lecturer at the University of Pretoria. She is currently in the last stretch of her PhD, exploring notions of embodiment in Virginia Woolf's writing. Her research interests include contemporary children's and adolescent literature, British modernism, literary representations of spatiality, and intersections between phenomenology and literary studies. Mureka's subject today is compositions of aesthetics and intimacy into the lighthouse. And I'm so pleased to be chairing your session and I look forward to everyone's papers. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Veronica. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for being our chair as well, for introducing us. So I will try just to uh, share my screen. Oh, just a second. Okay, I hope that's visible. I will try to make it bigger if possible. Um, no, where do I do that? Huh, I'm just wondering. Or maybe this. Yeah, okay, I think now you can see it quite quite well. Is that correct? Yeah. And you'll just want to do slideshow from the beginning. Yeah. Okay, so th so this should be the beginning if, if, yeah, if you can see it. All right. Yeah, so I will just at the beginning, I, I would like to say that this uh, talk is based on basically on my dissertation, which dealt with the parallels between Wolf and Whitehead, and also on my forthcoming article that is called Search for Beauty and Vivid Values in the Everyday. So Virginia Wolf and Process Aesthetics, basically. So I will here you can see the structure of my talk and now I would like to start straight away and in the slide actually you can just see um, the longer quotations that I included in my talk so that I don't do not need to read them. Okay, so, so from her autobiographical writing, we know that Wolf was endowed with certain hypersensitivity to her environment, often transformed into her famous moments of being, which were described in a sketch of the past. These moments of intensified perceptions are dispersed throughout Wolf's fiction and are important and I think in two respects. First, they induce a transformative change in an observer and second, they are triggered mostly by the observation of the environment, which represents also a source of almost sublime beauty. The surroundings in Wolf's fiction often comprise very ordinary objects, for example, pieces of stone or broken china in solid objects or a snail in the mark on the wall. Therefore, Wolf's writing foregrounds the mundane, which goes hand in hand with her statement from modern fiction, that the proper stuff of fiction does not exist, because everything is a proper stuff of fiction. This implies that the writer should focus on every minute detail, triggering some emotional and aesthetic response on the side of the reader. 
Wolf repeats this idea also in her essay, Poetry Fiction and the Future, where she suggests that we have come to forget that a large and important part of life consists in our emotions towards such things as roses and nightingales, the dawn, the sunset, etc. Yeah, okay, so Wolf's own sense of beauty intrinsic to the environment is often imprinted in her characters. The main protagonists, or sorry, the protagonists of the mark on the wall and solid objects are endowed with a childlike fancy to explore surrounding objects that provide a lure for further investigation. In the mark on the wall, the protagonist desires to sink deeper and deeper away from the surface and turns the mark into an aesthetic object, generating several trains of thought. In solid objects, John starts collecting thrown out objects, realizes their beauty, and becomes entirely obsessed with his quest at the expense of his promising political career. In his eyes, these ordinary object, uh, objects turn into precious stones, into gems or emeralds, as John learns to reattribute the overlooked value to the everyday material uh, world. And here it's uh, Lorraine Sim. Uh, reference. However, his rejection of the public function may also be read as a refusal to get involved in the structures of power which decide uh, about the destruction of our natural environment. Therefore, I would suggest that John's alarming obsession surprisingly enables the character to acquire more ecological and harmless approach to the environment. In Mrs. Dalloway, Septimus impersonates not only Clarissa, but also Wolf herself in respect to his hypersensitivity to the environment. He receives constant shocks provoked, for example, by bird singing, lavish greenery, or people's interpersonal interactions. His observation of these external stimuli often results in the overpowering emotion of joy, pleasure, and ecstasy accompanying Wolf's own moments of being. Moreover, Septimus's perception of the environment is primarily aesthetic, as he emphasizes that beauty was or is everywhere. For Septimus, this ultimate beauty is also an important aspect in the attainment of his concept of universal love, shaken by political decisions such as declaration of war or cutting the cre uh, trees, as he said, men, uh, men must not cut trees. Okay, sorry. I hope you can't see this. Uh, so in a sketch of the past, Wolf explains that her response to the external world is mainly emotional, which is similar to the emotional impact of a work of art emphasized also by her contemporaries, Roger Fry and Clive Bell. However, the emotion is not provoked only by the appearance of a particular thing, but mainly by its perfect intrinsic design and interconnected ness of its parts. Wolf exemplifies this on her perception of a flower, realizing the beauty hidden in the structure of the flower and its holistic connection with the earth. This ecological imagination of the flower based on interconnectedness is in her well-known quote transposed to the macro level of reality, which Wolf imagines as a work of art where human beings are its interrelated parts. However, the words that come immediately after this quote are even more important. Wolf suggests that there are no great creators such as Beethoven and Shakespeare, but that we are the words, we are the music, we are the thing itself. This entails that even a single human being may be described as a beautiful work of art whose value is assessed mainly by the creations and relations we leave behind. Uh, in Process and Reality, Alfred North Whitehead, philosopher and Wolf's contemporary, uh, develops an ontological system where the basic blocks of reality, actual occasions, are interconnected self-creative unities. These gather into larger societies, things in the physical world. Thus, each actual entity contributes into the resulting identity and value of a society as it has some value for itself, for others, and for the whole. While experiencing uh, the world around us, we get in touch with these vivid values. 
In Adventures of Ideas, Whitehead adds an aesthetic dimension to his ontology of interrelatedness. Each actual, occasions, each actual occasion is described as an object of intrinsic beauty, and for this reason, his ontology is often labeled an ontoethical aesthetics. While arguing that the universe is directed uh, to the production of beauty, Whitehead highlights that a beautiful society is not based on the sameness of its parts, but on discord, which enhances the whole. This suggests that Whitehead's ontological system is highly inclusive and welcoming of difference and diversity, which reminds us of Wolf's own concept of discordant harmony in between the acts. In science and the modern world, Whitehead applies these ideas to the analysis of modern society and claims that throughout history of our, of our civilization, man has been destroying vivid values found in each constituent of reality only on the pretext of achieving social progress. He suggests that we directed attention to things as opposed to values and that to satisfy our needs, ultimate values were excluded. This reduction of values led to two evils of society or modern society. First, the ignoration of the true relation of, our, of each organism to its environment. And second, the habit of ignoring the intrinsic worth of the environment. This implies the divide heads onto aesthetics based on the appreciation of values and beauty hidden in each constituent of reality overlaps with the main ideas of ecology. As a solution, Whitehead suggests retrieving the lost values and our primary relation to the environment, which would prevent us from destroying indifferently its beauty. Will's own focus on values of mundane things is even more intensified in the stories and essays foregrounding tiny organisms as valuable, unique, and beautiful. This is demonstrated in The Death of the Moth, where the moth impersonates vitalist energy, energy hidden each, in each creature, and she hints at our tendency to attribute life and value only to human beings. In The Sun and the Fish, the observers of the eclipse redefine their anthropocentric position. In the second half of the essay, uh, the people enjoy the view of colorful fish in a pool and manifest fascination with the creature's purposeless beauty. Wolf points out that even these animals do not exist needlessly and that the most majestic of human evolutions seem feeble in contrast to theirs to human one. As foreshadowed at the beginning of this presentation, Wolf extends beauty and value on the entirety of our environment, especially in her looking on essays. In the evening over Sussex reflections in a motor car, she analyzes how we can capture all aspects of the omnipresent beauty. This beauty triggers an overwhelming emotion in the observing selves who admit that they are overcome and mastered. In the second half of the essay, this overpowering beauty is jeopardized by modern progress personified by a little figure of the modern man, an anticipation of modern technological inventions. However, Wolf raises an important question. Does this little figure advancing through beauty, through death, to the ecological, powerful and efficient future satisfy you or satisfy us? This question makes the reader reflect on the price paid for modern comfort, and that is the loss of beauty in the environment. The same alarming tone is main maintained in Wolf's essay, The Docks of London, where she moves around land damaged by warehouses and factories and regrets the beauty which gave way to these ugly constructions. There she asks another question. Can it be possible that there is earth, that there once were fields and crops beneath this desolation and disorder? In the second half of this essay, Docks of London, who focuses on the commodities imported daily to the port. She emphasizes how things of natural origin are turned into commodities classified only by their utilitarian value. 
she says, every commodity in the world has been examined and graded according to its use and value. Thus, she echoes Whitehead's discussion of modernity oriented towards things rather than values and anticipates the criticism of animal abuse as a necessary practice sustaining the ingenious trade. And she says, flocks upon flocks of Australian sheep have submitted to the shears because we demand woolen overcoats in winter. In the conclusion of this paper, I would like to answer the question whether Whitehead or Wolf think it possible to reattribute aesthetic values to our environment. Although Whitehead hesitantly suggests in Science and the Modern World that civilization might never recover from the bad climate which enveloped the introduction of machinery, he outlines a way out. He claims that an important requisite for social progress is to cultivate our sense of aesthetic appreciation via education that would draw out habits of aesthetic apprehension. However, this education does not mean observing and analyzing art in museums and galleries, but intentional experience of any creation arranged in the best way to elicit attention to particular values. As it has already been demonstrated, these vivid values are intrinsic to everyday objects and phenomena, and we do not need any systematic instruction to experience them. As an example of ways how we relearn to appreciate beauty around us, Whitehead mentions the mere disposition of the human body and the eyesight so as to get a good view of a sunset, or to think of a factory in its completeness as about an organism exhibiting a variety of vivid values. Only this active interaction with our environment and its appreciation can defy the two evils of modernity, already mentioned. In uh, symbolism, its meaning and effect, Whitehead claims that artists should transmit their rapture of the experience of the immediate world. For me, Wolf impersonates such a writer, render, renders the mundane extraordinary and beautiful, and turns it into an aesthetic object. Moreover, Wolf attempts to penetrate beneath the surface of these objects, considers them in their complexity, and searches for their vivid values. In this way, she teaches her readers to reconsider our modes of thinking about the external world, encourages us to look for, look for beauty and value in every aspect of reality, and warns us against their destruction only for achieving satisfaction. For this reason, Wolf seems to be a perfect author, even for contemporary readers who become unnervingly aware of our distance from the natural world. In the Docks of London, she suggests that the only means to stop the trade and uh, yeah, the trade and exploitation of external sources is a change in ourselves. Like Whitehead in Three Guineas, she also argues for the implementation of aesthetic education in the curricula of the new college and instructs the readers to question the long rooted practices of our civilizations, she says. Things we must, think we must, let us never cease, cease from thinking. What is this civilization in which we find ourselves? Melina Pereira Savi suggests that this famous quote may be transposed to the context of ecology and associated with our relation to the world around us. By foregrounding the aesthetic aspects and values in our living and non-living environment, Wolf achieves to create ecologically sound texts, Kostkowska uh, reference, in the same way as Whitehead envisages an ecologically sound metaphysics. They both teach us to search for a more harmonious and harmless mode of being. And that's all from me. So I will just stop sharing. I hope you can see the access copy in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much, Veronica. And I'm sorry, I tried to, to indicate that your slides were not advancing, but I think everybody could see what you had on them. I, we can see that oh. you've made beautiful slides. I'm sorry that they didn't seem to get 
to get shown, but uh, oh, I'm sorry. Share, if you want to share a link to your slides, you can put that in the chat as well. Yeah, I will do that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Is there an immediate question for Veronica before we move to our second presenter? All right, then let us proceed. Mary Claire. Great, thank you so much, Veronica. I'm happy to be following on your heels because I am also going to be talking a bit about the sun and the fish. So before I begin, I wanna make sure I get this share screen. Okay, so I share screen on um, Zoom first, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, there, here it is. Um, okay, share that. And here is this. And make sure you hit slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Great. Great. All right. So um, I do have a new title. <clears throat> it is Penumbral Passages, Virginia Woolf, William James, and the Ethical Space Beyond Language. Nearly 100 years ago, on June 29th, 1927, Virginia Woolf witnessed the total eclipse of the sun from the Yorkshire countryside. She later recorded her impressions of the event in her diary and in an essay memoir published shortly thereafter, entitled The Sun and the Fish. If the title sounds like a fable, that may be no accident, though this short piece lacks an explicit maxim. That withstanding, my work interprets the moral implications of Woolf's narrative through not only its thematic content, but also through the language that conveys it. The sun and the fish is both a literal representation and rhetorical illustration that respectively describes and performs the privileges and perils of verbal language insofar as humans largely rely on words to determine their own subjectivity and the surrounding structure of we, what we know as the real world. William James, whose work helped establish the field of psychology and the philosophy of pragmatism, explores the very same ideas in the stream of thought. This detailed study of the physiological changes associated with how humans think occupies the ninth chapter of the two volume thousand plus page Principles of Psychology, a labor of 12 years, finally published in 1890. The stream of thought has become James's most famous metaphor for human mental activity and is well known to literary scholarship through the modernist style called stream of consciousness. Much of Wolf's work, including The Son of the Fish, notably employs this technique and it is on these grounds that the two writers are commonly examined. In this pre presentation, I look beyond the metaphor of stream of consciousness and approach Wolf's language from another aspect of James's foundational analysis, namely the stream surrounding consciousness, that is, what words do not or cannot say. The Son and the Fish reveals how conscious thought corresponds to language a relationship that is both empowering, but also has a limited ability to express the entirety of experiential life. For Wolf, witnessing the solar eclipse is an experience that words cannot capture. Um, seeing the world go dark, as well as the corresponding feeling of universal annihilation, ultimately back, backlights the awareness of self and its interconnectivity to the entire world across time and space. By comparing James's scientific analysis to Wolf's essay, we discover that the two writers share a moral philosophy best expressed in the metaphorical figure of the solar eclipse. So this presentation follows the same tripartite structure of the sun and the fish and also matches each of its three distinct scenes to three specific ideas proposed in the stream of thought. These ideas are as follows. Number one, conscious thought derives from language. Oh, I'm sorry, corresponds to language. They feed into each other. Number two, language has limits. Number three, the limits of language reveal the interconnectivity of the human community and of the human and non-human world. The three scenes of Wolf's essay narratively represent and rhetorically perform these ideas through a series of visual and verbal crises in which the narrator or seeing and speaking subject becomes increasingly aware of her intrinsic relationality to all things. First, in the constitution of individual consciousness. Second, in the relationships that form a collective human consciousness, which corresponds to our conception of reality. And third, 
in the awareness of an extra phenomenal universal mind conjoining humanity with the non-human cosmos. I call this progression inner subjective, intersubjective, and super subjective. The opening section of The Sun and the Fish recounts the inner subjective crisis provoked by experimenting with the so-called mind's eye. Alone in the darkness of a winter's morning, Wolf investigates the mysterious workings of memory as it relates to language. She hypothesizes that the mind, when directed toward a word, summons forth an image signifying that word, which subsequently mobilizes hosts of other images somehow related. Befuddled by the heterogeneous collection of images illogically aroused by this experiment, Wolf concludes that there must be some underlying emotional reservoir. She writes, for a site will only survive in the queer pool in which we deposit our memories if it has the good luck to ally itself with some other emotion by which it is preserved. Sites marry incongruously, morganatically, like the queen and the camel, and so keep each other alive. The sexual implications here are beyond the scope of this presentation. Anyways, the queer pool from which such random imagery surfaces is an internal crisis that compromises her faith in the supposedly autonomous subjectivity of human life. With dismal sarcasm, the experimenter concludes that language is an insufficient tool for describing the entirety of human consciousness. Even if words can name the various tableau of memory, they fail to measure the emotions that tie them together. Words a Wolf's game of the mind's eye verifies William James's model of human consciousness detailed in the stream of thought. Alongside his metaphor of the stream, James evokes the flight path of a bird in order to illustrate the duality of mental experience. Of this alternation of flights and perchings, the bird may recall each exact branch where it has landed, but the ever moving particles of air within its swerving voyage cannot be possibly traced. The same holds for the thinking mind, which comprises so-called substantive and transitive parts. The substantive parts are the fixed perchings, which are vaguely connected by ephemeral flights or transitive parts. We can also explain this idea in Wolf's terms. The stream of thought traversing the mind's eye is structured by substantive sites or perchings that are connected by transitive flights or married incongruously, morganatically. Taken all together, the perchings form a heterogeneous collection emerging from an unchartered queer pool of flights. As you can see, Wolf and James approach this same idea not only with different words, but from different angles. To Wolf, inability to articulate the queer pool marks an inner subjective crisis. For James, awareness of the very existence of this pool, of the flights or transitive parts, is an affirmation of the inner subjectivity that distinguishes each individual life. James explains the relationship between verbal language and mental thought as necessary, but also insufficient. Words have been conceived to name the substantive parts of consciousness, these being the qualities of experience that attract our interest. Ascribed to grammatical status as nouns, adjectives, verbs, and so forth, these concrete, stable, identifiable objects of thought are useful in directing our attention. However, they do not capture the transitive parts linking them in conscious succession. Rather, language tends to overlook intermediary happenings or thoughts of relations between words, which slip into the unconscious. James compares these intermediary moments to the gaps between words in human speech, which he describes as bare images of logical movement, psychic transitions always on the wing, so to speak, and not to be glimpsed except in flight. Without words to name them, there exists a limitless number of relations that can be felt between the substantive parts. Conscious thought does not know the unconscious relations that drive its very existence. Furthermore, enveloping each substantive unit of thought, be it word, image, sound, combination of sensations or otherwise, is an ambiguous fringe of psychic overtones that attests to the feeling of the thing itself. He writes, Every definite image in the mind is steeped and dyed in the free water that flows around it. With it go the sense of its relations, near and remote, the dying echo of whence it came to us, the dawning sense of whither it has to lead. lead. The significance, the value of the image is all in this halo or penumbra that surrounds and escorts it. The overlaps in the fringe about each substantive unit constitute the transitive portions. The true meaning of anything we hold in conscious thought is only discovered in the fringe of it. Unfortunately, these meanings lie typically unattended because verbal language has not trained us to the habit of feeling these subtleties of experience. 
In The Sun and the Fish, free association of memories confirms James's theory of the language thought binary. However, Wolf's narrative demonstrates the struggle of language to forge uncertain and arbitrary relationships among these disparate images. Of Queen Elizabeth, Wolf writes, the old lady in horn spectacles, the late queen is vivid enough, but somehow she has allied herself with a soldier in Piccadilly who is stooping to pick up a coin, with the yellow camel who is swaying through an archway in Kensington Gardens, with a kitchen chair and a distinguished old gentleman waving his hat. Dropped years ago into the mind, she has become stuck about with all sorts of alien matter. The connected tissue of grammar, punctuation, hyphens, commas, and semicolons, conjunctions, button and, and the preposition with, sutures together several phrases skirting vast lengths of space and time in order to cram no less than five disparate memories into a single sentence. The effect of reading is a sense of confusion, even exhaustion. Words can hardly keep up with these images of memory whose meaning remain ambiguous. Wolf's narrative meets another obstacle in trying to convey the way that emotion infuses physicality and the interplay of unconscious and conscious experience. Her vocabulary is limited to the words I and mind, which seem to be the byproduct of the Cartesian discourse of body and mind operating in isolation of each other. She employs the possessive mind's eye to resist this philosophical tradition and assert mind-body duality, for there exists no other term in the English language that satisfies her meaning. Wolf continues to test the language thought duopoly by recalling a memory that challenges her ability of verbal and visual rendering. This strange spectacle subverts the eye and on the wings of emotion swiftly flies, flies to the mind. She writes, so on this dark winter's morning when the real world has faded, let us see what the eye can do for us. Show me the eclipse, we say to the eye. Let us see that strange spectacle again. And we see it once. But the mind's eye is only by courtesy an eye. It is a nerve which hears and smells, which transmits heat and cold, which is attached to the brain and rouses the mind to discriminate and speculate. It's only for brevity's sake that we say that we see at once a railway station at night. In this passage, Wolf concedes that her interrogation of the mind's eye is not exclusively visual. Rather, it is merely an arbitrary language term, a courtesy meant to express conscious thought. Similarly, the verb see, set in quotes, is a linguistic shortcut representing all bodily experience, including hearing, saying, reading, writing, that constitutes living in the real world. Because the solar eclipse is therefore not just an optical event, its verbal transcription demands the shadowing and obscuring of conventional rhetorical forms. Wolf's writing responds to this demand and also imitates the mind's eye by emulating the central concerns of its discourse, namely the relationship between experience and memory, vision and language, conscious and unconscious thought. The integration of Wolf's personal experience of the eclipse and its written narration for a wide readership reveals the way that language unites human communities. The transition from the individual to the communal is evoked not only stylistically, but also grammatically with vigorous punctuation and an emphasis on shifting pronouns. Wolf initially apprehends the people in the crowd as separate from herself, but soon become aware of her relationship to them. She writes, they have a provisional extemporized look they have that moving and disturbing unity which comes from the consciousness that they, but here it'd be more proper to say we, have a purpose in common. Parentheses enclose the epiphany of community as she comments on the arbitrary linguistic convention of we intended to convey it. Wolf assumes a shared and expansive mode of perception in explaining how the pilgrims lose sight of their differences in favor of a holistic appreciation of their human legacy and cosmic kinship. She writes, we were no longer in the same relation to people, houses, and trees. We were related to the whole world. We were come for a few hours of disembodied intercourse with the sky. You can read the rest, I'm going to skip. Together, the modern sightseers transcend the imminence of their situation and partake, partake in the timeless eternal presence shared by many ages of mankind. Grammatically, the increased use of semicolons as opposed to periods brings the independent clauses into greater intimacy, just as this participatory vision unites the umber files on the hill. The desire for disembodied intercourse echoes the yearning to understand the free association of the opening scene. In contrast to the frustrating inability to articulate morganatic marriages constituting the mind's eye, Disembodied intercourse suggests an alternative to the Cartesian notion of living physically and living mentally as two separate activities. Rather, this phrase captures what James would call the fringe, 
that exists beyond the conscious perceptions of the body and the substantive parts of thought. Disembodied intercourse is the sublimation of the discourse of the body and mind, vision and language. Wolf's narrative then illustrates another sort of intercourse by describing the superposition of sun and moon during the eclipse. This event reveals the two celestial bodies by negation. The sun is obscured and the moon is shadowed. The sun is an illuminating force representing intelligibility and therefore corresponds to the substantive parts of thought and language. When eclipsed, the sun becomes something felt, not seen, as the moon intercedes and gradually smothers its rays with growing shadows. These shadows are like the fringe that suffuses thought and language with meaning and subjective value. When the eclipse reaches totality and the penumbra darkens the sky, it is as if the fringe were to overtake the form it surrounds, be it word, thought, sight, or other perception. When this happens, when language falters and vision fails, what becomes of living in the real world? How are individual human beings meant to understand themselves or communicate and interact with others? The moment of the eclipse takes this crisis to the next level by revealing how the direct correlation between visual perception and verbal expression compromises the human community. Unable to perceive the world, the subject is also unable to describe it. The same goes for the writer trying to reach her readers. Wolf's narrative demonstrates this intersubjective crisis with an abrupt syntactical transformation, evoking the aphasia of witnessing nothingness. Long, loosely flowing phrases lapping over punctuation in the illusion of a single fluttering thought abruptly shift to short, close trim, matter of fact statements trailing off in a few unremarkable adjectives. She writes, so the light turned and healed over and went out. This was the end. The flesh and blood of the world was dead. Only the skeleton was left. It hung beneath us, a frail shell, brown, dead, withered. The feeling of lost verbality enshrouds her memory of lost visibility and dramatizes the dizzying sense of lost overall subjectivity. And yet within the same paragraph, suddenly and subtly, the sun returns and resuscitates those uh, uh, faculties determining selfhood and community. The onlookers share a feeling of relief as the darkness recedes. They now embrace a new mode of seeing or way of living, signified by a shower of colors spilling over the landscape. She writes, Yet at first, so light and frail, the strange and strange the color was, sprinkled rainbow like in a hoop of color that it seemed as if the earth could never live decked out in such frail tints. It hung beneath us like a cage, like a hoop, like a globe of glass. It might be blown out, it might be stove in. Here, color can be understood as a metaphor for the substantive parts structuring our experience of the world. These colors appear more vibrant after they have been temporarily obscured. The hanging skeleton of the penumbra has been replaced by a delicate phosphorescent orb. What hung beneath us is no longer extinction, but a world renewed. This newly appreciated polychromatic patina represents a heightened awareness of the vague and vast universe of coexistences, or as James would say, of the thoughts of relations conjoining the elements of consciousness. For Wolf, the penumbra that reveals human intersubjectivity also causes her to reconsider the way she uses words to convey meaning. Her vocation as an author depends on this vital feeling, which makes language such a precious though limited tool ensuring the survival of humanity. The concluding sentence in Wolf's eclipse memory quivers between the gloomy awareness of mortality and the exuberant feeling of togetherness. She writes, but still the memory endured that the earth we stand on is made of color color can be blown out. And then we stand on a dead leaf and we who tread the earth securely now have seen it dead. The post-eclipse scene correlates to James' belief in the value of investigating those unworded thoughts of relation. James argues that the more we consider the feelings around the thought, the better we understand the meaning of it, which will influence the next thought that we subsequently choose to entertain in consciousness. Essentially, attending to the thoughts of relation makes one a better thinker. Furthermore, the quality of thought doesn't just affect intellect, it also affects ethics. The ability to perceive and choose from among numerous possible outcomes implies a moral scale governing not, governing not only thought, but also the action that thought produces. James writes, an act has no ethical quality whatever, unless it be chosen out of several, all equally possible. What a man shall become is fixed by the conduct of the moment. Using language, speaking or writing in communication with others is a good example of such an action. 
By considering the subtle valences of feeling surrounding each word, its fringe, we make sentences that are more accurate, vigorous, and meaningful. Like the penumbra of the sun that draws our attention to the colors of the world, the penumbra of a word calls us to appreciate the ways we relate to those around us. I'm gonna skip that scene. The third and final section of The Sun and the Fish extends the psychic adventure of the mind's eye to the zoological gardens of London. An aquarium exhibit offers a vision of compromise between the opposing forces of death and life, language and experience, individuality and cosmic community. Swarms of fish move in a way that seems at once non-rational and yet deliberate, a yawing pattern that calls to mind the penumbral scene, unordered and unordinary, but still coherent. Again, Wolf evokes color, light, and geometry to structure her memory of this vision. She writes, tanks cut in the level blackness enclose squares of immortality, worlds of settled sunshine where there is neither rain nor cloud. There the inhabitants perform forever evolutions whose intricacy, because it has no reason, seems the more sublime. Blue and silver armies keeping a perfect distance for all their arrow-like quickness shoot first this way and then that. The discipline is perfect, the control absolute, reason there is none. The most majestic of human evolution seems feeble and fluctuating compared with theirs. Wolf's diction reveals an epistemological shock or what I call super subjective crisis brought to the surface through vision and language. The phrases squares of immortality and worlds of settled sunshine suggest a teleological understanding of the tanks, which cut into the blankness, also resemble the sun before the eclipse or the specific words we carve out of lived experience. However, Wolf's use of the word sublime destabilizes this rational, albeit performative order. The fish swim with a freedom that defies the rigid confines of their tanks. They do not follow a predetermined path, but determine their own voyage through the water. Rather than delving into Kant's definition of the sublime, I want to suggest that this term relates to James' notion of the fringe, the so-called penumbra about conscious thought and worded language. The fish represent an experience liberated from, uh, from the concepts and ideas outlined by language and even from the units of conscious thought. Rather, they yaw about in a way that is paradoxically disciplined and controlled, perfect and absolute. For us human beings to achieve the purposive freedom of these fish, we must search around the substantive parts that assure us of our own subjectivity and implore the transitive parts that attest to their emotional and spiritual coherence. Wolf's narrative continues to struggle against the 19th century philosophical traditions of teleology and human exceptionalism by anthropomorphizing the fish and regarding them on the same level as human beings. She writes, nothing exists needlessly. The shape of the fish is not geometric and their movement is not linear. Similarly, Wolf's rhetoric wa uh, wavers in a zone of uncertainty. There is the double negative of nothing and needlessly, the way that the fish se seem to have been shaped by a higher power yet possess the agency to be themselves. The tension between being sufficient and being perfect. And finally, the ellipses trailing off into a question. Moreover, teleology in which things have been made haunts her perception, just as the arbitrary conventions of language trouble her expression. Like her confusion about the memories of the mind's eye or the apprehensive darkness and speechlessness brought about by the solar eclipse, the super subjective crisis of the fish enables another level of understanding, this time crossing the categories of self and species. By juxtaposing the human and non-human, Wolf assumes the humility of a more than human or super subjective sensibility. Individuality and all of humanity are still but a fragment of the cosmos, teeming with so many forms of life. The annals of the zoo embody the limitations of linguistic expression and of the thoughts that we hold in consciousness. They also offer the possibility of greater participation with the world beyond these constructs. Every living thing, each endowed with its own mode of vision and language, yields an entirely different world from our shared universe. William James concludes his chapter on the stream of thought with the same idea about the plurality of consciousnesses beyond those of human beings, including those of cuttlefish and crab. Each unit of life exacts its own artistry simply by participating. Wolf's essay must rely on words to weld the disparate memories of shadowed sun and glimmering fish. It concludes quite literally with a dead world and an immortal fish, a phrase that relates to the limits and possibilities of her artistic vocation a combination of dead letter and immortal meeting. 
It is the juncture of sun and fish that poses an ethical opportunity, one that makes a fable of this tripartite narrative. From the dark introspection of the individual mind to the penumbral pan uh, panorama of the self among other selves, to the sun-soaked epiphany at the aquarium, Wolf urges us to recognize the disembodied intercourse through which we are incorporated into that perfect existence. The central figure of the solar eclipse provides a necessary shock that challenges the concepts and customs bounding experience and reorients our, self from, our sense of self from personal inner, inner subjectivity through humanly intersubjectivity and then into cosmic super subjectivity. Moreover, the language used in The Sun and the Fish teaches its reader to attend to the feelings about an experience in order to appreciate the fullness of the universe and our potentiality within it. This moral corresponds to William James's final meditation on the ethical value of interrogating one's own stream of thought. He writes, the problem with man is less what act he shall choose now to do than what being he shall now resolve to become. Each conscious perching and each unconscious flight literally change one's mind and thus remake one's being. To think feelingly is really to swim like the fish at the zoo in the tank of our own experience. With enough openness, interest, contemplation, and compassion, we may seize the opportunity of becoming a better version of who we were. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Claire. Um, I'm going to uh, just kind of move to our final speaker and then we will have our uh, uh, extended question and comment period at the end. So Marika, please take it away. Marika, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself, Marika. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stop video because my presentation's on my other screen, so I don't want to look like I'm gazing off into the distance. Um, am I audible? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to share my presentation very quickly. Apologies. Um, Okay, there's that, and then one. Two seconds. Um, just going. Okay, can everyone see PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay. The sections of To the Lighthouse from Lily Briscoe's perspective present a sustained rendering of a visual artist's perceptions. In doing so, Katz argues that Wolf proposes that the world itself takes a radically fluid form, determined by the sequence and intensity of our perceptions. The attention given to the lived perspective is clearly evident in the phenomenologist Maurice Muller Ponty's writing, which focuses on the interdependence of all phenomena. I aim to explore overlapping between the two writers, particularly how the world as experienced is what is to be expressed when expressing the real, and how the novel illuminates the implicit ethics of Murder Ponty's philosophy. Murder Ponty's aesthetics essays cover the philosopher's incorporation of painting and sculpture in his discussions of perception and the nature of reality, with the goals of the philosopher and painter aligning as two sides working on the same problem, 
to give expression to existence, to give form to the formless, or to give new form to old forms. Both essays are grounded in understandings of the lived perspective, where the painter takes his body with him. Immersed in the visible, the tangible, the seer does not appropriate what he sees, he merely approaches it by looking, he opens himself up to the world. Such a nodal conception treats artistic processes as a network of impressions, which are not easily separated into disparate elements such as color, shape, or texture. The artist's vision, therefore, is better figured as seeing with or according to perception, rather than looking at something from a distance. For both Merleau Ponty and Wolf, the artist's project is an acknowledgement of and dwelling within being, which relies upon their own feeling and the expression of what exists. The descriptions of Lily's painting process in the window emphasize the embodied experience of the artist as she tries to capture her vision while painting and in conversation with Mr. Banks. Perceptual immersion proves elusive, however, as she loses her focus in that moment's flight between the picture and her canvas and between the moment of attention and the desire to translate it or explain it to another. Lily's desire for perceptual immersion is similar to Merleau-Ponty's descriptions of Cezanne's painting process. Cezanne's widened eyes in this quotation mirror the physical tension of Lily's senses in the moments wherein she tries to capture the artistic vision of her surroundings. Cezanne's success seems to lie in his ability to sustain the state, described in his movement from the sketched framework to his overlay of color as he germinated with the countryside. The sense of communion between Cezanne and the landscape marks the moment of felt reversibility, where it was as if the landscape became able to express itself through him. Lily's feelings of failure are the result of a partial acknowledgement of this reversibility. Although she displays a strong desire to foster the intense focus of her artistic vision, the moment she becomes aware of herself as an inhabitant of the intercorporeal world, she's beset by doubt and the whole thing changes, um, the demons set upon her. The productive flow of this intercorporeal relationship is broken by the debilitating rela realization that she exists not only as the subject of her lived experience, but also as the object of another's gaze. The moment of reversibility, therefore, highlights her intercorporeal existence, but also reinforces her anxieties about the seemingly irreconcilable separations between other aspects of her life and her pursuit of art making. Her search for the spirit in Mrs. Ramsey, the essential thing, is framed by a consideration of character or identity as shape, first the perfect triangular uh, shape on her canvas, and then the twisted, um, uh, and then the twisted finger of a figurative glove. As Berman argues, the twisting of the glove marks not only the particularity of a singular being, but also the experience of otherness tinged with the desire for intimacy. As she tries to convey her vision to Mr. Banks, she joins together her difficulties at realizing the vision she has of her painting with her desire to know the spirit, the essential thing of Mrs. Ramsey. How, Lily asks, can Mrs. Ramsey embody both the representative beauty and values of mother and child, as well as seem completely unknowable? In this section, her increasingly desperate questions regarding unity and intimacy mirror the felt reversibility between her and her canvas, or between her and Cezanne's, between Cezanne and his landscapes, seeking both to know and to be known. If Lily can reach such an intimate understanding of Mrs. Ramsey, she might be better understand both the compositional balance which she seeks for her canvas and the balance between her and Mrs. Ramsey's views. The negotiations between Lily's desire for intimacy, which makes one inextricably the same, one with the object one adores, and her longing to hold onto the treasure of her art and autonomy is left in the window in a state of partial resolution. She bridges their alterity through her intuitive comprehension of Mrs. Ramsey's selfhood as the painted purple triangle, which resonates clearly with the wedge-shaped core of darkness. But the expression of this intuition is incomplete as the connection is only experienced by the reader's notice of textual similarity. As Merleau Ponty writes, the world is what I perceive, but as soon as we examine and express its absolute proximity, 
it becomes inexplicably irremediable distance. Knowledge, unity, or intimacy are momentary uh, expressions of proximity, which like the horizon seem to recede as we approach it. Connection therefore, in terms of both aesthetic composition and intersubjectivity is not a dichotomy or a process of reconciliation of polarized terms and dialectical tension. It is conversely in there where two movements cross, a chiasmic process which Merleau-Ponty terms the hyperdialectic and which arises from continual questioning. Intercorporeality in both aesthetic and ethical terms follows a wave-like motion of convergence and separation. The intervening time between the first and last sections of the novel and Lily's two paintings marks the relationship between Mrs. Ramsey and Lily once more as irremediable distance. Mrs. Ramsey's death and the time which has passed between the two visits means that the link that usually bound things together has been cut, leaving Lily navigating both the composition of her remembered painting and her relationship with Mrs. Ramsey in her absence. Lily's painting process includes a perpetual intertwining of her physical stance and movement with her free flowing memories. In doing so, the narration continually associates the physicality of her gaze with the process of reflecting upon her experiences. Although the memories might spurt unexpectedly into her consciousness, her canvas remains a space where these ideals and memories are refashioned into art. Lily's recollections negotiate the possibility of memory's permanence, particularly Mrs. Ramsey's ability to bring others into a sense of communicating, community by ver merging and flowing, harmonizing discordant elements into something which survived complete. One of Lily's little daily miracles is the recognition that Mrs. Ramsey is able, as Lily herself tries, to make of the moment something permanent similar to the unity and structure which the candlelight brought to the dinner party scene, they might in the midst of chaos be shape and a moment may be struck into stability through willpower, memory or art. Wolf's descriptions of the slow building up of visual and tangible depth of paint and images on a canvas tunnel into the past so that modeling with paint is both an act of creation and of reflection. Lily's feelings that she might be sitting next to Mrs. Ramsey on the beach while she paints suggests that reminiscence acts as a transcendent dwelling or shared inhabitation of the memory space. As she paints, she feels as if a door opens and one goes in and stands gazing silently about in a high cathedral-like space, echoing the architectural imagery of Mrs. Ramsey's selfhood presented in the window. Space becomes an intimate reflection of the self to which Lily, through the simultaneous processes of memory and painting gains access. Importantly, this moment of intimate reflection is not possessive. It marks a revision of Lily's previous questions regarding intimacy. Silence or haunting the edges of an intimate togetherness as Lily had previously imagined of herself becomes a careful balance of activity and passivity. One remains open and receptive, but also willing to rest in the extreme obscurity of human relationships. In this way, the artist's fascination stretches beyond a focus on an individual's being in the world during the present moment and encompasses a sense of being which might, through reflection and creation, illumine the darknesses of the past as folded into the present. Lily's grief abandons formulated expressions as inadequate in comparison to her desires. Will words break up the thought and dismember it? And prefigured phrases about life, about death, about Mrs. Ramsey are futile. Desire therefore needs to be grounded in pre-reflective perceptual experience that does not immediately grasp for expression. However, just as her interrogation of the nature of intimacy was left unresolved in the first section of the novel, a sense of someone there, of Mrs. Ramsey, only returns after the pain of the want and the bitter anger subside. Merleau Ponty, in a description of his desired philosophical approach, argues that things offer themselves, therefore, only to someone who wishes not to have them, but to see them, to let them be, and to witness their continued being. He refigures the center of complete emptiness that Lily feels from a void to a hollow in which the other might find the resonance they require. The depth of Lily's non-possessive reflections and creation of material weight through the paint on her canvas. 
The spatial metaphors of distance and depth are joined together in Lily's meditation on the extraordinary power of distance. If depth had been the means by which one might access memory and aesthetic desire, distance is the measurement of not only the physical separation of individuals, but also the possibility of intimacy. It is through this attention to the perceptible world before habits have spun themselves across the surface that distance and depth are filled with an unreality and vividness which highlight both difference and intercorporeality. As Merleau-Ponty writes in discussing the relationship of self and other, certainly I do not live their life. They are definitely absent from me and I from them. But that distance becomes a strange proximity as soon as one come home, back home, as soon as one comes back home to the perceptible. In contrast to the possessive desire to grasp or understand which dominated her earlier thoughts of Mrs. Ramsey, Lily begins to realize that one got nothing by soliciting urgently. Instead, her artistic practice should be grounded in the fascination to which she had previously aspired. Language and pre-configured aesthetic position, uh, compositions, the phrases and visions and pictures, all fail and fall short of authentically translating the painter's vision. As evident in previous sections, the artist's fascination instead requires a return to pre-reflective experience, the jar on the nerves, the thing itself before it has been made, and a patient awaiting or germinating with one's surroundings. Artistic vision then is marked by plurality and openness. One needed 50 pairs of eyes to see with, and all the partial views one catches sight of must be welded together. All that the eye's versatility disperses must be reunited. Intercorporeality in the window is marked by a wave-like divergence and overlapping as things and people draw closer and further apart. Lily's desire for intimacy is matched by a shifting horizon of revelation and occlusion. Uh, uh, apologies. A shifting horizon of revelation and occlusion. As Mrs. Ramsey's selfhood, the contents of that cathedral-like space remain largely unknown. The start of the lighthouse is marked by a pervasive sense of strangeness, of symbolic and interpersonal relationships straining in vain towards some remembered meaning. The fissures of the intervening years complicate Lily's questioning of the method and scope of intimacy and compositional unity. The artist's fascination, which figured during the window as only a momentary respite for Lily before the circumstances of her life interfered with her vision, is resurrected and deepened during her painting process in the lighthouse. While this attentiveness and receptivity were initially a guidance for establishing the authenticity of her composition, they gain an explicitly elegiac and ethical framework in the final part of the novel. The return to pre-reflective experience requires a passivity and openness to the world, which in turn leads her to express her vision. In attempting her painting again, she must reconsider the problems of composition, which she believed she had solved. Johnson, in a discussion of repetition and the hyperdialectic, considers that it might function in artistic terms as something which is recollected forward, thereby dovetailing past and future into a unity as a from to temporal structure to recollect creatively with a new horizon of difference and anticipation. Lily's first tunneling into the hollows of her memories marries this. She resurrects what has been, but finds that the momentary triumph of knowledge over Mrs. Ramsey denies the realization of aesthetic or ethical unity. Instead, it is only through a passive openness to the intercorporeal world that she is able to dovetail her memories into a new aesthetic vision. All done. Thank you so much. Marika, and thank you again, Veronica and Mary Claire. What a fascinating set of papers with all of these connections to aesthetics and seeing and the everyday um, questions and comments for our panelists. Please use the, the reaction raise hand feature or put something in the chat if you wish. Would someone like to begin? Mary Claire, please. 
All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Marika and Veronica. Um, I was struck by the fact that we all kind of use the word habit and we're contemplating the idea of the ethical possibilities in the pre-reflexive, the, the, um, the time before concepts jump in. Um, I wanted to also draw a connection between uh, Veronica's presentation and Marika's and ask the two of you if you've any thought about the way that um, uh, this, the, the the way that Wolf comes to like these these epiphanies, there's uh, I think Marika used the term there's a shifting horizon of revelation and occlusion, like this constant wavering of oh this makes sense, and then there's something else and it all dissipates, and you have to have another kind of gestalt moment in order to um, reach the next idea and to me that that uh, uh, reminded me of whitehead's idea of concretions and the way that you know just um yeah i i think of i think of the term gestalt really like you you form a pattern you form a, an idea and then um something else might happen and i guess i was wondering if you either of you had thought about the way that habit interacts with this process of um uh forming conclusions because i did that even that even to me seems like a kind of habit like we always want to um get the big picture like it's kind of like we're, we're drawn to I, I think of like these things like paradigm i forget what the term is like when you when you want to see a face in something or you want to see an image constellations um i was wondering if your work uh, uh or your research you'd thought of the idea of like habit and uh these shifting horizons as Marika stated well. Veronica, did you want to go first? I don't mind. Yeah, okay, thanks. I'm just thinking, I, I, I don't know actually what, what I might respond to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also happy that, that Mary Claire uh, drew in the concept of concrescence of Whitehead's concept like, all the minute parts go together into one whole and then they actually disappear and they are renewed again. So I think this might describe Bull's idea of thoughts coming together into some kind of shock. And then she continues with another one and another one. So I think that's a really good parallel. And I'm thinking about that question of habit and maybe novelty as well, because that's also a very strong idea in Whitehead. So you have some kind of habit or some kind of traits even of your personality your behavior are constantly passed over but at the same time you you always get something new as well because novelty is also a part of that concrescence and i don't really know what else i might say to that i'm just trying to think of a sketch of the past where she talks about these moments of vivid perception moments of being and actually I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I like the, the fact that if I can jump in here, the fact that you meant uh, mentioned Gestalt actually, um, because Merida Ponzi is um, definitely affiliated with the Gestalt um, like section thinking, etc. Um, but I, I find the the very interesting thing that he says about Gestalt is that. Um, Indeed, as both of you have said, things draw together and they seem to be resolved into this kind of you know, clear relationship. This is what we're focusing on. This is the background kind of thing. And then, um, but he says that that language, that connection between people, um, even just like the way in which a, a person moves through their life is also generative and is continuously able to produce new things. And so you don't move into like a kind of closed cycle of um, pre-reflective experience and then expression thereof, et cetera. It, it never closes up into a, into a neat circle. It is able to generate new creative projects. Effect. I love that. Thank you sense. so much. And Veronica commenting on uh, the idea of novelty. I think you can even think of like Wolf's mm -hmm. novels as like little gestalts, even so far <laughs> as they are incredibly experimental and constantly leading into the next thing. Thank you. 
And I think also the perception of the same object is very different every time you actually observe it. So that comes to it as well. Okay. More comments, observations, questions for our panelists. If I can, again, uh, I was really, yeah, thank you. I was really happy uh, while uh, listening to Mary Claire's presentation when she talked about uh, William James and also his concept of superhuman actually consciousness of some kind of cosmic co consciousness, which I also included in my dissertation. It was really great to see because in my dissertation, I also worked with the sun uh, and the fish in the way that the eclipse is some kind of shock as, as, as you put it, that actually urges the people to relate. So they can realize that it's a kind of common collective experience so they can work as, as a community but it has never occurred to me uh, like connected also with the language of the essay and it really makes sense and how it is structured and so on so it was revealing for me so thank you please Stacy go ahead thank you um, this is a question from Marika um, I was really, really um, fascinated by the way that you uh, bring together the kind of question about emotional unity and then aesthetic or compositional unity in Lily's painting. And I wondered, you know, Lily is, um, she's thinking about Mrs. Ramsey. She's looking at the window. She's calling out to Mrs. Ramsey, but she's also um, looking out at the lighthouse and she's watching the boat progress towards the lighthouse. And I wonder if you, could say something about that element in the, the painting scene in the third section. I mean, because she's thinking about Mrs. Ramsey, she's relating to Mrs. Ramsey, but she also has a certain relationship to the family and to Mr. Ramsey. And the question of distance comes up both in her memories of Mrs. Ramsey and then the physical distance of looking out you know, onto the horizon and seeing the lighthouse. So where does that, where does the relationship to Mr. Ramsey and the children come into her, you know, act of creation. Hmm. Um, no, definitely. Uh, there's there's an interesting thing that it, it starts with, you know, extreme proximity actually between her and him. He stands like very close to her personal space, and, and she has to you know, say nice things about his boots. Um, and it's almost as if. Uh, she feels very uncomfortable in that in that moment before they leave um and it what i found interesting about specifically her interactions with mr ramsey um a little less with the children but um with him proximity is dangerous to her sense of self her sense of calm as an artist and as a woman mm -hmm. um and then it seems to resolve itself like their how she views their relationship is resolved by distance rather than proximity. So it's a kind of a paradox that um, connection can be brought by distance. That if things are too close together, it doesn't work out. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, that's very helpful. Yeah, that's a helpful thought. Yeah, that her distance from him is enabling. And then. Um, Regarding the lighthouse, I it I confess that I still can't pinpoint what I want the lighthouse to mean, um, <laughs> which I suppose I, I could leave open ended if you take Wolf's infamous response to Roger Fry, um, but it is as if a shared journey in space, either the physical journey of the Ramses on the boat and then her into the past, so physical and temporal space, um, resolves the lack of connection that you see at the beginning of the window where nothing seems to make sense and everything seems to be disjointed because Mrs. Ramsey isn't there. 
Um, and so the lighthouse in the end arguably is the center of her picture and is that journey becomes the center of this kind of intersubjective and aesthetic balance between the different parties. Um, now I'm talking in circles. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Cool. Emily. Hi, so my question is specifically for Veronica. Um, I really liked your paper, but you say uh, towards the end, um, you, I died the sound because it was neat. Uh, Wolf attempts to penetrate beneath the surface of these objects, considers them in their complexity and searches for their vivid values. In this way, she teaches her readers to reconsider our modes of thinking about the external world, encourages us to look for beauty and value in every aspect of reality, and warns us against their destruction only for achieving satisfaction. So I'm, I was really intrigued by this. I'm wondering how you might um, kind of take your work as an interdisciplinary approach to the humanities and also the sciences, because it's, I think it's very interesting how you uh, kind of apply ecology to this, and I'm also a scientist. So how might you envision you know, your work uh, helping not only those of us in the humanities, but also the people in the sciences better understand their impact on the environment. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it's, it's a really good comment, yeah. As, as I know, so Whitehead also discussed science a lot, so in his book, Science and the Modern World, and actually what he, what he was pretty much against what the, was the kind of mechanistic vision of nature that you can actually uh, see nature as thing which is somehow abstracted from human beings and he said that it's basically impossible to if you study something like i don't know even like particles or whatever you can study so you can't really extract the subjective experience of it you can always like relate your own subjectivity to this object of observation of, of study and i think yeah probably if we kind of realize this and also if the scientists would realize this then we would actually really cause more let's say harm and and we would see ourselves as the as those parts of the world so yeah and um and he actually somehow again in this book he somehow anticipated that the romantic poets actually saw nature as, as this organic part and he said or organism basically and he said that actually this is how science should approach their objects of study so i think this these ideas might be uh, really used uh, in science as well and basically, and there is an, uh, in, again, uh, not in this book, but modes of thought, uh, he says that scientists or a specialist shouldn't be actually somehow closed in his study only and focused on his uh, subject uh, or study, but he should also be able to take into account other disciplines that also the scientists should, has, should have some aesthetic education and should actually somehow share his knowledge or sh share his knowledge with other disciplines. So I think it might be used as well. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, that was helpful. Are there other questions? I'll try to toss out a kind of maybe, you know, moving us toward a conclusion here. I'm thinking about the role of time or temporality in the way that each of you is thinking about um, perception and aesthetic, you know, the aesthetics of beauty, the aesthetics of the everyday experience, the idea of inter and intra connectivity species um, moving across species and and how how time functions for for each of the ways in which you're you're drawing on these different philosophical systems I hope that doesn't seem too too obtuse um, but that's what I kept I kept coming up against especially thinking about the passage of time into the lighthouse or the passage of time that wolf invokes in the sun and the fish you know going back to Stonehenge for example um, 
any does that seem like a like a worth worthwhile kind of way to bring the three of you together here at the end let me just open it up if i can start like what i think there is common between our presentations and i would say again wolf and probably even whitehead whom i talked about i would say that wolf always sees let's say uh, the past that leaves some trace on the present moment. So you can't really distinguish between the past and the present because it's pretty much built upon that past. And it is the very same idea in Whitehead's metaphysics. As I said, the smallest particles of universe are actual occasions, and they are basically like series of experience from, let's say, the first one until, let's say, the present one. So the past is always present there. And I think it, it, it's pretty much the same for uh, William James, but I don't want, don't want to talk about this. Go ahead, Mary Claire. Yeah, th thank you so much for um, giving me the word trace here, because I think that that's exactly what um, William James is talking about with the way that the, the thought thought is a stream. Um, and, you know, really, you can think better, we, you can pay better attention. We would talk about crisis, like in this day and age, we are in a crisis of attention. We have so many devices, um, so many things that we, you know, trying to like steal from our time and also giving us ideas before we even have that like pre-reflexive gut feeling about, you know, what do I think uh, before we even start thinking. Um, so I think the value that we, um, um, the best thoughts and the best writing takes time. And I say that as one who has yet to complete my dissertation. Um, Wolf is in it. I didn't, it's about bodily pain, by the way. So do contact me if you know anything about Wolf's aches and pains. <laughs> Marika. You need to unmute. Unmute, unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. I thought I pressed it. Um, yes, I, I love um, what both Veronica and Mary Claire have said. I think that that sense of trace of continuation um, becomes a, an interesting kind of multi-layered nodal concept in that you've got past into present, present into future kind of connections flowing through and being refashioned and rethought in Wolf's writing and the way she uses language. Um, and then you also have that stretching between people in the present moment. And so every interaction basically becomes a, a list of, well, not a list, a, like a, a little web of um, textual and kind of character interchanges. Um, and then with, um, time passing in particular, I, that section I really liked because, um, or working on because it was, um, a section where perception is, has no human equivalent until Mrs. McNabb comes back. And so, um, you get to engage with a piece of text, which is not even trying to be the human being ex experiencing the world around it. It's without humans. Um, and uh, I would be very, very interested to read both of your guys' um, your, your work and finished, published or in progress, um, because I'd love to see the connections between all three fingers and the ways in which we conceptualize them of linking to Wolf has that kind of taken those traces further as well. So thank you. Any final comments for our panelists? What an incredibly rich way to start the day or, or to finish the day or, or in the middle of your day, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in. <laughs>
But thank you so much. This has been just a very rich session and it's just wonderful to see this generation of, of, of scholarship um, taking form. So thank you. Let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. And good luck on, on your dissertations, those of you who are finishing. <laughs> and congratulations to Veronica. All right, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks, everybody.